Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hoi Feng Pun from Microsoft Health Feature. I'm very excited to be here to tell you a little bit about uh, our latest work in advancing generative AI for precision health. As we all know, in cancer, stand-up care often fail and the last hope for the patient uh, is a clinical trial. So here is Martin Tannenbaum, who uh, is a successful AI researcher and e-commerce entrepreneur. At the peak of his career, he was diagnosed with late-stage melanoma. Now, fortunately, Martin mobilized his network to find a matching trial that saved his life. So since then, uh, he completely pivoted his career to helping cancer patients because he correctly recognized that most patients don't have the resource like him. So ideally, what we want is a continuous learning health system that can instantly incorporate any health information to optimize uh, healthcare delivery and accelerate discovery. Uh, a key underpinning uh, towards uh, this kind of vision uh, is uh, how can we leverage uh, all this kind of like real world observational data from patients, right, uh, that had already been clinically, routinely collected in clinical setting and to distill the real world evidence to actually help uh, uh, actually uh, accelerate the progress in this uh, continual learning health system. Now, the, of course, uh, this is uh, very exciting and you can think about it as essentially a population scale free lunch. The challenge, however, is that in the health system, uh, it's really sort of like plagued by all this overwhelming amount of unstructured data. So in cancer, in the US, uh, less than 3% of patients were able to find matching trial, whereas the big chunks of uh, clinical trial failing uh, stem from simply be, uh, not able to find sufficient patient in time. And drug development can be extremely uh, lengthy and, and, and cause an astronomical uh, uh, amount of money. So um, here's actually where the latest progress in generative AI can potentially change all this uh, for good. In particular, large language model possesses uh, this sort of like emerging capability that what we'll call universal structuring uh, that can actually help, you know, uh, structure a lot of those uh, uh, unstructured data and thereby instantly unlock a lot of these kind of top value applications. So this can be likened to what have been happening in the general domain, right? So the digitization of a big chunk of uh, human knowledge in the web enable us to portray this uh, very powerful uh, large language model that can uh, that are now start revolutionizing a lot of the general software categories. So likewise, in biomedicine, there has been rapid digitization for a lot of uh, biomedical records uh, uh, data. And here is a famous uh, graph that shows how the sequencing costs drop much faster than the Moore's law. Um, but meanwhile, actually, uh, sort of like a largely understated disruption is actually how rapidly the medical records have also been, you know, digitized, uh, re which actually happened fairly recently. So from all this kind of like uh, biomedical data, uh, if we can unleash the power of uh, LM, uh, then we can potentially attain a similarly amazing transformation uh, in precision health. So uh, we are pretty fortunate at Microsoft to uh, start exploring a lot of the LM application in health uh, very early on, uh, uh, four years ago, we released a PubMed Burr uh, for uh, kind of like biomedical, exploring biomedical la language model. Uh, we are very excited to see sort of like a lot of exciting work coming along these directions. Uh, we are excited to see how the community have find uh, PubMed Burrs uh, quite useful uh, in some of these applications. So PubMed Burp can be viewed as sort of like really this kind of like first generation uh, biomedical foundation models. Um, and in the sort of the relatively low resource setting, right, it's uh, actually sort of useful to kind of like concentrate the compute uh, and modeling uh, on the, the biomedical contents. Uh, however, uh, with the sort of the advance of this kind of like new frontier model like GPT-4, uh, things actually can, uh, progress can actually be uh, 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 advanced uh, even uh, even faster, right? Uh, for example, in clinical trial uh, matching, uh, one of the big bottlenecks uh, is uh, all this elaborate inclusion exclusion criteria. 
Now, quite amazingly, you can basically come up with a pretty naturally sounding uh, instruction uh, and then uh, prompt the GPT-4 uh, and out of the box uh, without any actual specialized uh, kind of like uh, trainings or fine tuning or anything, uh, GPT-4 can already parse uh, this kind of fairly uh, elaborate kind of like uh, uh, matching logic. Now, of course, uh, if we put you know, GPT-4 at the stress test uh, of over all 300,000, you know, trials uh, in the CT.gov, uh, obviously we'll uh, find a, a long tail of uh, various problems, but still out of the box, um, uh, this is actually uh, really kind of like something that we have never had before in NLP, right? So it can already serve as an 80-20 kind of like starting point. Now, for anyone who have worked on clinical child matching, obviously you know that uh, the much bigger bottleneck actually lies on how can we also interpret and understand what what what's the patient information so that we can actually match against those uh, criteria, right? So here is a the idea uh, the identify a patient journey where each bar uh, signify a, a particular note, right? And then uh, a lot of the basic cancer information. Uh, that useful for matching are actually uh, scattered uh, across uh, many nodes, right? So in collaboration with uh, 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 Providence and uh, we have actually developed a pre-state of the art approach, uh, again, based on the first generation foundation model, uh, where we essentially train uh, oncology BER model and, and show that it actually can uh, extract structure, a lot of this kind of relevant pa uh, patient information fairly uh, accurately. Um, what's actually pretty amazing is that uh, now that we have the frontier model like GPT-4, what we find out is that once again, we can actually essentially ask the model to read the menu, right? So uh, in this particular case, for example, for clinical staging, right, we can put the menu uh, for uh, how the staging criteria into the PROM along with a summary of the patient records. And amazingly, out of the box, uh, GPT-4 can already actually structure a lot of this information uh, fairly accurately, in many cases, even comparable to some of this kind of like first generation model that we have to especially kind of like fine tune for the, the, those applications. So um, putting all this together, uh, this is a uh, uh, kind of like a demo of our clinical child matching system with uh, synthetic uh, uh, data. Um, so Providence is the third largest uh, health system uh, in the U.S. Um, and we are quite excited that they start using our uh, research system uh, in their tumor board as well as some of the high profile trial uh, as shown here. Um, and the trial PI, Dr. Rom Lenner, described to us at the beginning of the project how painstakingly it used to be uh, for him to, you know, spend pajama time scouring the nodes to find even one candidate match, right? Um, but now uh, with this, we can essentially do just-in-time clinical child matching 24-7, uh, monitor the change in the patient and monitoring new trial and actually suggesting kind of like new potential candidate match in real time. So a lot of this, uh, uh, is, is very exciting given that clinical child matching is such a really important application, but actually a lot of this foundational technology can also be used to unblock many similar kind of like uh, knowledge work in the whole health system. Uh, and here the, the exciting opportunity is to harness the uh, LM's uh, universal structuring capability um, to essentially uh, uh, and unblock and, and really speed up many of these uh, kind of like high value uh, applications. So beyond text, uh, there are also many other kind of like information rich modalities such as imaging, multi-mode mix and so forth. So this is actually a really exciting kind of like growth space is that how can we actually expand uh, and start to assimilate all those uh, modality, right? Um, LM also display kind of this really amazing reasoning capability. So now if we can actually unleash this on the population scale data, uh, we can potentially uh, uh, reach an unprecedented speed and in accelerating precision health. Um, so one thing I want to emphasize is that um, unlike the first generation foundation model, right, we should 
we shouldn't think about this kind of latest uh, frontier model as merely just uh, uh, empower us to you know go a few uh, accuracy point higher but they really begin to be able to set kind of like new patterns and changing the way that how we can operate right so we talk a little bit about how universal structuring that can allow us to really be able to structure population scale uh, patient information uh, it can literally be used to translate between languages but also be able to translate across uh, different onco uh, ontologies, right? Like OMOBs, uh, fires, and so forth. So this can actually potentially accelerate interoperability. Uh, it can be used uh, to actually generate actually uh, 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 new training data and also help uh, scaling up evaluating complex tasks, as we will see some example later. And most uh, excitingly is that it has this sort of like really amazing reasoning power that can actually potentially enable us to essentially talk to the data and uh, also synthesize uh, uh, also sort of like lots and lots of kind of like background knowledge and 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 start to make, you know, generate new hypothesis and, and, and make discovery. Um, so specifically sort of like, uh, in you know uh, for cancer for example right so um uh, some of the cutting edge uh, uh, therapy is like immunotherapy which actually hold quite a lot of promise as it can start to have effect on some of the really late stage cancer right um and unfortunately even for some of the kind of like cutting edge uh, drug like Hichuda, uh only a minority of patient response right so and um and there has been already kind of like, you know, millions of cancer patients who have taken this kind of checkpoint inhibitors. So um, if we can actually analyze those real world examples, uh, compare the non-responder versus the exceptional responder, we can potentially figure out what actually, what's wrong in the, the patient who don't respond and, and actually accelerate progress. And, and here, of, of course, the idea of using this kind of real world data uh, is not new. But in the past, oftentimes they, uh, due to the technological limitation, they have been largely focusing on the structured data, which missing out a lot of the granularity of the information. So here, what's the sort of like true significance of the Gen AI uh, disruption is that we can potentially unlock all this kind of like fine grain longitudinal information in the structured data, and thereby sort of like un un unlock a lot of this kind of dark matter in the uh, real world evidence uh, universe, right? So ideally, we want to be able to sort of empower everyone in the health ecosystem from, you know, providers and, and, and uh, all the way to, you know, drug development and uh, also, you know, uh, value-based cares and so forth. And here, uh, this, the LM can potentially serve as a spark and catalyst, right? To make, you know, uh, previously kind of like infeasible kind of like manual processing to now suddenly become much faster. And thereby, eventually we can essentially be able to empower everyone with a valuable data store, right? To turn that into a, a kind of like a scalable discovery engine, right? Um, so obviously this is very exciting, but there are still lots and lots of challenging ahead and we can sort of boil them down to essentially like uh, two main questions, right? Does it work? Is it safe? And here real world data can really provide crucial evidence. And we want to also emphasize that human in the loop uh, actually hitting the sweet spot of human computer symbiosis is the key, right? And going forward, I will quickly uh, highlight a few kind of like uh, exciting directions, right? So uh, first, like uh, there has been obviously a lot of uh, excitement about, you know, uh, doing problem engineering, but actually the bigger picture here is that we can now start to empower sort of like domain expert to basically program by natural language, right? So there are lots and lots of exciting frontier. Here, what I just want to highlight one particular aspect is that, um, uh, obviously, LLMs still have lots of growth space about like hallucination and omission and so forth, right? But here there is one potential aspect is that you can use LLM to self fact check themselves, right? So, so the the key insight here is that um, generation is a much harder problem. But if you already have an answer, you try to verify it, that become a much much easier problem. Just uh, you can liken that to kind of like in CS one hundred one like P versus NP, right? So 
in particular, let me show you sort of like one very simple example, right? So let's say if we have a clinical note and we try to, you know, get out from, you know, uh, what are the, all the problem lists, right? And um, no matter how hard you engineer the problem, it's actually very hard to get it right in the first uh, uh, shot, right? But we actually don't need to do that, right? We can let the LM to give it the best try, but then uh, ask LM to actually generate evidence for each extracted problem, like why does it think that that's actually the legitimate one, uh, and then ask LM to verify it by itself. And then we can also continue to actually try to find whether there are more, right? So in this way, we can potentially uh, uh, sort of like address, you know, uh, both the hallucination and uh, uh, an omission uh, uh, error, right? And then, uh, so here's a real example on the DID, you know, clinical notes, like in the first pass, it get a bunch of problem lists, uh, they are all right, uh, which is a good start, but that's far from enough. Um, but when you try to ask it to try again to find uh, more, uh, it was able to find a, a number of uh, additional problems. Uh, Moreover, for each one, they, it was uh, actually able to uh, show actually some evidence, uh, rationale, right? And also in some cases, the GPT-4 actually determined actually the, it, it may not be actually that uh, correct. Um, and human can actually easily chime in here to either agree or disagree, right? Um, and then it can continue and actually find additional one and also fixing some of the hallucination or, or precision error along the way. So in doing this, uh, we find that actually pretty amazingly that with just very simple self fact check exercise, uh, it can actually fix uh, 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 quite a bit of the error upfront. Um, so, um, we, we can also use an LM as sort of like really sort of a noisy kind of like teacher, right? So um, for example, in the problem of extracting adverse drug event from biomedical text, right? Um, the, the LM out of the box already performed pretty well, but still have some gap from the supervised state of the art. However, if we can uh, just, for example, in this case, we're using GPT-3 uh, to annotate 50,000 PubMed abstract and then using those uh, kind of like uh, noisy uh, annotation to kind of like fine tune uh, PubMed Burr, uh, we can actually not only recapitulate uh, most of the performance app, but actually perform a, a bit better even than the noisy teacher itself, right? So, and also the model is uh, obviously a lot smaller. Um, so this could have relevance if, if uh, cost and latency could be a constraint, right? Um, so obviously, Assuming that we can start to structure all this population level real world data, um, we are still uh, 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 quite a bit, you know, away from really be able to make correct sense of those data, right? And one of the big bottlenecks is that there could be lots of confounders uh, in this kind of real world observational data. So um, here we basically try to incorporate both the LM's uh, structuring capability as well as uh, some of the state-of-the-art causal reasoning capability. And in this way, in collaboration with our Providence uh, uh, collaborators, we were able to using Providence uh, real-world data to actually simulate some of the marquee lung cancer trial, for example, the original Kichuda trial and including some of the failed trial, right? So we can compare the published hazard ratio on the left side and also the simulated hazard ratio on the right side, and we were able to find that they are actually pretty comparable. Um, so obviously, uh, this is still kind of like very preliminary, but but shows uh, some of the promise uh, down the road. Um, so finally, I will conclude by highlighting uh, this very exciting growth area in the multimodal uh, longitudinal space, because this tend to be the biggest kind of like growth area for some of this general domain LM. Uh, simply because a lot of this data is obviously not available in the public web, right? Now, why would multimodal be important, for example, for immunotherapy? Uh, one of the big growth area is how can we actually understand the tumor microenvironment, uh, how the tumor cell, immune cell, normal cell actually situated uh, against each other. And this is information that oftentimes you can only find from something like digital pathology slides, right? Um, and so it's important to include uh, all this kind of multimodal information. Now, if you ask a general domain models, right? Like for example, something like a medical imaging uh, query, like a lung CT scan, 
uh, it actually doesn't understand it very well. Um, but the key point is that uh, by actually uh, uh, bridging the competency gap, right, we will be able to actually very quickly uh, um, uh, be uh, uh, bridging some of those gaps to make them actually understanding the medical image much better, right? So uh, here we basically show a kind of like a very general recipe, right? So the first observation is that there are often a lot of naturally co-occurring uh, image and text pair, right? Or in general, for any other modality, oftentimes there is some text uh, description that can serve as natural language uh, instruction, right? So given all this kind of image and text pair, we can then start to look into exploring a general recipe uh, of uh, Lava Met, right? That can be basically used to bridge the competency gap uh, uh, in, in the latest model. So the first key idea for Lava, Red, uh, Lava Mat is that we take a modular approach, right? So we plug in any image encoder and text decoder, uh, plug and play from any pre-trained model. And then we focus our learning on this uh, adapter layer that is basically trying to translate those modality into the text space, right? Um, and so in, in this way, we basically deviate from the traditional contrastive learning like clip where you treat all the modality equally because texts actually have a lot of advantage to serve as a sort of a common interlingua, right, across all the modalities. Um, and one of the reasons is that uh, you can then harness uh, some of these uh, frontier models uh, uh, capability. And, and then uh, concretely, how do we actually uh, uh, do the training is by actually using GPT-4 to come up with multi-model synthetic data. So specifically, we can take any medical uh, image text pair, right? We take the text and then we ask GPT-4 to come up with a conversation about the original image, right? So the instruction is actually very uh, straightforward. We basically ask it to generate conversation so that uh, it has to be depending on the image, right? Uh, it cannot be answerable by just the question alone and so forth, right? Um, now, given the generated question answer pair, we add back the image and that image question answer triple can then become essentially sort of like uh, almost an unlimited source of uh, instruction following data uh, from the original kind of like naturally uh, co-occurring image text pairs. Now, uh, in LavaMed, we look into using some of this kind of public image and text pairs. Uh, we can also uh, imagine adding uh, 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 kind of like image decoder to try to also model sort of like, you know, uh, patient disease uh, progression, for example, given an image and then given a disease progression description, can you actually generate counterfactual images, right? Um, so sort of doing some sort of like in circle imaging. So it turns out you can use a very similar recipe. Um, and then you can also using that to for, you know, uh, digital pathologies and other. So I want to acknowledge my amazing teams, uh, as well as a lot of our collaborators without whom obviously we can't do any of this. So thank you.